If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to John 17. Um, it is good to see uh, many of you uh, back here on uh, this Sunday morning for a, a few weeks there. You know, we were, we were down to uh, Don and uh, Eric and Jenny and uh, back, back Kurt in the back, and, and those people are fine company. Uh, don't 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 get me wrong. Uh, they are they are really, really fine company. But uh, it's good to uh, it's good to see you this morning and have uh, you back. We're uh, making our way throughout the summer months through John 17, uh, which, without much doubt, is one of the more um, profound uh, sections of the New Testament, uh, simply because of the words of Jesus in his prayer. Uh, in there, we were talking about this uh, together, uh, uh, Don and I, this, this last week. In their simplicity is their profundity, and we'll see that right in our text for this morning, where the simplest language, uh, when meditated upon, is found to declare the most profound things that you can really reflect upon, uh, especially when you're reflecting, as Jesus really asks you to do, on your own experience of being a Christian in the categories that he understands you to be a Christian in as to how it took place, because it takes place in such of a, a profound, profound way. Uh, but just before we uh, stand together and read that uh, text, um, I learned through uh, Shirley this morning, who, uh, re who learned through Shelley, I, I think Shelley Nelson, yeah, Shelley's shaking her head, that Dale Devish uh, went into the hospital yesterday, had a um, pacemaker put in, um, some blood tests taken. Um, he is, the, the blood tests are, are pretty concerning. And so he is still in the, in the hospital uh, today, those of you who know Dale's in his mid-80s, but uh, he is, of course, the 100% uh, caretaker for his wife. Uh, so I, I would assume that maybe one of the daughters have come. I don't know how they're really, how, how that is going, what's happening right now. I just heard of this uh, this morning, but um, uh, we'll be praying uh, for Dale in just a moment, but you be uh, praying for him. as well. Let's stand together. Verses 1 to 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are our God. And we earnestly seek you. Our souls thirst for you. Our flesh faints for you. Even as we find ourselves 
in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Lord, we are very aware of desert-like experiences for people in the world over these last months all around the world, most places in the world, uh, much more desperately felt even than here. What a dry and weary land this fallen world can be for people. Lord, we praise you that we are able to look upon you and meet you in your sanctuary, meet you in the ultimate sanctuary, the temple of your Son, whom you raised from the dead after three days. Your grace as seen in Jesus, the psalmist would tell us, is a steadfast love that's better than life. And as we reflect upon it and as we talk to you about it, we can only praise you. We are wise to bless you as long as we live and lift up our hands before you. May our souls be satisfied with the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. And when we wake in the middle of the night, as we do at times, may we find ourselves meditating upon you. Lord, we think of Dale in this regard. I am sure that he has spent a bit of time awake in the night, thinking about how his present circumstances relate to his ability to care for Lois, and with many questions. And I pray that you would meet him there. And we think of Pat and Sandy when they wake in the night and think of the road ahead with chemotherapy and a PET scan coming up. May they find you waiting for them there. Graham and Kendra Brower in a similar set of circumstances as they wait to test results from Kendra's surgery and from all of the chemotherapy and the things that she's been through as they wake in the night May they find you there and the thought of you comforting. And many others here find themselves awakened in the night and looking. And may you enable us to see that you are there and that you have pulled us under the shadow of your wings in such a way that we find ourselves able to sing for joy, that our souls would cling to you as your right hand lays hold of us. And so, Lord, as we come and consider what has happened to us in Jesus here in John 17, may we find ourselves so encouraged that you are our King. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and may we find ourselves exalting in your name and for your name's sake. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Seems like a, a lifetime ago, I, I, used, I was a trombone player at one point in my life and, uh, and played for our stage band in uh, East High in McHenry, Illinois. And uh, in the early 70s, uh, there was a very, very popular uh, rock band. It was actually from our area, the Chicago area. They called themselves Chicago. And they had a fairly extensive brass section. 
uh, for a rock and roll band, and, and therefore the arrangements to their popular tunes were very easily carried over by uh, band directors into a uh, high school uh, stage band. Uh, two of the songs that were prominent in our uh, repertoire was one called uh, 25 or 6 to 4. Uh, some of you will remember that if you're old enough. And the second one is the one that uh, we're interested in uh, for this morning. It bore the title, Does Anybody Really Know What Time It Is? There's a really nice trombone part in Does Anybody Really Know what time it is. In fact, the trombones are featured uh, in, that, in that particular uh, song among the, uh, the central cadences in the song. Now, in the, of course, in stage band, the, the lyrics were not involved, but our, uh, we're, we're interested in the song for its lyrics this morning. Uh, and it opened this way. As I was walking down the street one day, a man came up to me and asked me what the time was that was on my watch. And then they said, yeah. And I said, does anybody really know what time it is? And a little echo in the back, I don't. Does anybody really care? Care about time? Does anybody really know what time it is? Does anybody really care? Um, in John 17, as we saw last Sunday morning, John 17, 1, Jesus is tremendously aware of the time. And he knows exactly what time it is. So he's both aware of the time and he cares deeply about what time it is and, and hands that sort of time-related information off to us as disciples. Remember how it was put in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. There's the time. The hour has come. It's both the hour of Jesus' death. It was the hour of the accomplishment of his life's work on earth. Soon to be the hour of his resurrection. However, it's also the dawning of an hour that lasts quite a long time. As we noted last week, jump out of John's Gospel and then back into it with this whole time-related thing. Luke twenty-two fifty-three. 53, as Jesus is being arrested, he says to them, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you didn't lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is your hour. And this hour, which we're going to see in a moment, he, uh, he understands to going to be lasting for a long time. We're still in it. This hour has the power of darkness manifesting itself very prominently within it. The previous chapter in John 16 that we looked at last summer, it opened like this. I said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, and here's the time language, indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. The hour is coming when, when somebody kills somebody like you, it'll certainly strike them as a righteous action. Now John goes on in his first epistle to put it this way. 
little children. It is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know it's the last hour. been a couple of uh, stories in the news that uh, remind us uh, of this hour that that he's talking about. Uh, those of you who, uh, like I do, uh, listened to Al Mohler on the briefing last week, uh, he quoted uh, city councilman uh, Corey Johnson from, uh, from New York City. Uh, he was commenting on uh, the organization Samaritan's Purse, and particularly uh, the head of that organization, um, uh, Franklin Graham. And, uh, and here's, uh, here's how he put it. Uh, this group, meaning uh, Samaritan's Purse, which is led by the notorious, bigoted, hate-spewing Franklin Graham, came to New York at a time when our city couldn't in good conscience turn away any offer of help. That time has passed, he said this last Friday. Their continued presence here is an affront to the values of inclusion, and it is painful for all New Yorkers. So Samaritan's Purse showed up. They set up a field hospital in Central Park and in another location to take overflow uh, from an overburdened healthcare system in, uh, in the city of New York. And uh, for doing so, uh, the leader of the organization is considered the notoriously bigoted hate spewing Franklin Graham. Um, and this, uh, because Franklin Graham um, does not seem to fit well into the New York City's values of inclusion. So you can see, inclusion has to be fairly carefully defined. Um, uh, there, there's, cer there's certainly certain people that you're, you're not supposed to in include. Uh, and Franklin Graham is among them. We'll come back in just a moment to uh, why, uh, why, why that is. Uh, but the, um, it raises the issue, do you know what time it is? That's, how could he say that? Well, it's not surprising at all if you know what time it is. Um, it, it's the last hour. And even as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, many Antichrists have gone out into the world. In fact, Antichrist philosophy just dominates the city council in New York City. Dominates the uh, voting population of New York City. Clearly. Clearly. I state our thesis for this morning this way. Believers are given eternal life through the authority of Jesus. Um, and eternal life uh, is, is being set over and against, in this context, of course, the context of our long life. Eternal life versus life in this Hour. For any human life only makes up a teeny little piece of this hour, as John defines it there. So three questions that we'll ask to verse 2, um, and we'll pull verse 1 back into it as we uh, get to the end again. First then, where is authority grounded? Where is authority grounded? Now, let me just read from verse 1 into verse 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son in order that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him 
authority over all flesh. You have given him authority over all flesh. Now, as I mentioned here in John 17, the simple language is the, is the language of sort of the biggest picture possible to consider things in. And you hear that since he has given him authority over all flesh. You, that is the Father, have given the Son authority over all flesh. Uh, I mentioned last Christmas that back in 1973, we as high schoolers, we went to see this uh, uh, exhibit that they were running in Chicago down at the Adler Planetarium. Uh, and if you've ever been there, you know, they just have a projector that shoots a, a picture of the universe onto the ceiling um, in the place. And uh, as I mentioned then, as I thought about it again, I mean, you know, you go in there and you're, you're, you know, 15 years old and a little too cool for that kind of thing, actually, uh, or for really anything. Um, but man, when they, when they turn that, when they turn that projector on, you, you know, you go from seeing this really unimpressive looking ceiling to feeling like you're on a mountaintop scaring, staring off into the universe. And that happens in, in a fraction of a second. And it just sort of throws you back in your seat. Like, oh, wow. And they still put people in there. Uh, Michael and Gene were telling me their son lives in Chicago. Now it costs 60 bucks to go in there. So well, why would anybody go sometime and have them show you that and then you'll see how they get 60 bucks for that. Because uh, it does. It throws you. It throws you back into your seat. And in the context of John 17, see, you're, you're, you're being told here, the creator of that gave authority to his son over all flesh. So our question, where is authority grounded? Well, authority is grounded in the creator of that. Oof. All things, the universe, all authority finds its basis in the Father, right? We are we saying that together this morning. The opening, the opening verse of how great thou art is basically a reflection on Psalm 19, uh, which said, The heavens declare the glory of God. The, the, the works thy hands hath made, we sing. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the poet in that hymn, the works thy hands hath made, the creator of all things. In the beginning, God created the heaven of the earth. That's how the Bible opens. And Paul tells us later that everybody knows it. It's unmistakable. You can't miss it. The only way you can miss it, the way atheism works, is by a massive effort of suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, a popular Roman a uh, Catholic author wrote a book called What You Can't Not Know. Uh, Jay Budaszewski from down in Texas. What you can't not know, that's his point. Everybody knows this. You can't miss it. Uh, and so what John, what Jesus is, is reminding us of as we listen to him pray to his father is that the Father, the creator of all things, is the one who gave authority over all flesh to Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate authority um, underneath his Father. So over all flesh, that's over the human race. Yeah, but remember, if you listened as a uh, uh, the call to worship text was read for this morning from the end of Matthew's gospel. Here's how it's put there. Verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Well, as we've said many, many times now, and we'll say many, many more times, that little phrase, heaven and earth, merism, 
figure of speech for all things. All authority, things, heaven and on earth. That is just to include everything, everything, everything. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So back to our introduction. You see Corey Johnson there in New York City. By whose authority? By whose authority is Franklin Graham um, notoriously bigoted and hate spewing? Well, certainly by the authority of the city council of New York City. Uh, certainly by the authority of the activists LGBTQ group uh, in the United States, certainly by the authority of the voting, the major voting blocks in the metro area of New York City that elects that sort of city council over and over and over again, by their authority, true enough, Franklin Graham is honestly considered as many of us would be, notoriously bigoted and hate-spewing. Now, his main crime uh, is uh, that he believed Jesus when Jesus said this in Matthew 19. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now, if you didn't know it, that is notoriously bigoted, hate-filled language right there. He made them male and female. And said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. So according to the authority of the city council in New York City, Franklin Graham is a notoriously hate-spewing bigot. But according to the authority of the one who has authority over all things in heaven and on earth, he's simply a disciple, repeating the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose authority he's simply trying as a disciple to represent. And so the question for us is, whose authority shapes us? Whose authority do we look to? Whose authority is defining in our lives? That's a really important question to have a clear answer to. Secondly, what does it mean to be given to Jesus? Now, this is where, if you're, if you're looking at the ESV, my outline doesn't make a lot of sense. Because what the ESV did was change the word order of the, the Greek New Testament. And my outline is based off the Greek New Testament. So we're going to switch over to the NASB, which didn't change the word order. Kept it. So uh, here's how it is in the ESV. Um, Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that... All to whom you may give to him, he, oh, excuse me, no, that's the NESB, I skipped over. So here's the ESV. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. So there's the, the word order switched. And here's, here's the word order in the Greek New Testament, and the, and the NASB reflects this. Even as you give him authority over all flesh, that, or in order that, to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So there's our question. What does it mean to be given to Jesus? What does it mean to be among those who are in this group, 
all whom you have given to him. And this is an example of what I opened with saying about John's gospel. This language is incredibly simple. There's this group of people who are given by the Father to the Son. That's all he says so far. That's all he says. Um, He says, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, in order that to all whom you, Father, have given to me, And he's going to talk about giving them eternal life. But what does it mean? And who are these people who are given by the Father to the Son? That's the question. That's the question. Uh, He's talking here about the genuine people of God. And so think of it. Uh, We we don't usually... talk about ourselves in in terms like this. If somebody asks you how it is that you became a follower of Jesus, generally speaking, what we do is we give them a, a testimony that includes things like the following, and there's nothing wrong with this. This is perfectly legitimate. In fact, it's, it's, it's necessary, it's right, it's good. But uh, we, we, we would say things like, well, I was, raised, you know, I was raised in a home where this would be the kind of thing I would say. I was raised in a home where uh, the Bible was read night by night. You know, we were uh, carted off to church every time the, the, the doors opened. Uh, my older brother and sister came to faith, eventually to pretty life-changing faith, uh, right? In, uh, in, in front of me, and so I, I showed an interest in this in one sense from an early age, but eventually I, you know, I read this particular book, which had a, just a really, really big impact on me, and that's sort of how I got here, all right? But all kinds of people raised in, this, in, in those same circumstances they don't care squat for Jesus now. Not at all. Uh, and you can hand them the same book that I read, and they might read it cover to cover. And then they just say to you, and you found that interesting. Huh, well, I guess, you know, different strokes for different folks. I don't get it. I don't see anything. I don't, I don't see anything in there uh, that's very interesting at all. Uh, and and which, which raises the question, well, why do some sets of friends really have this big impact, and why do some books have this big impact, and why, you know, why does a sermon have this big impact on one person and just never on, on another in any sense at all? Uh, and John is answering that question. But Jesus is, and John is recording it. Augustine is considered to be certainly the most profound of the early church fathers. It's not an accident. His longest two expositions, by far his longest, is the Psalms. But then his second longest exposition is the Gospel of John. Because Augustine, as a philosophical sort, he really loved the sorts of categories that he found in the Gospel of John. And they raised these sorts of very simple questions uh, for for him. Uh, Augustine asked at one point, when you look out at the human race and you see who comes to faith and who doesn't, he says, he says, just this is the question it leaves me with. Why one and not another? Why one and not another? Why does one person come to Jesus and somebody with the same influences in their life shows no interest at all? He said, I don't get it. Why one and not another? He goes on, it's a mystery to me. It's the mystery of the cross. Now Jesus is 
is answering that question in a way that is shocking. Shocking and disturbing. But his, he's answering it. And his answer is, not everybody is given from the Father to the Son. That's his answer. Not everybody is given by the Father to the Son. But if you are a believer, you know you were given. That's why you're a believer. That's the ultimate explanation. When you go back of the books and back of the people and back of the influence and back of the prayers and back of it all, what you find in Jesus' mind and in Jesus' prayer is this. There is a group of people in the world who is given by the Father to the Son. So, well, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. Well, a lot of people don't like that. It's right there in the Old Testament. It's the whole story in the Old Testament, right? You hear the little, the, you know, the little phrase, and it's, 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 it's really true as you read through the Old Testament. How, how odd of God to choose the Jews. Why would he have ever done something like that? Why would he have chosen Abraham's offspring, given that he has, I mean, all the exiles that are coming. Uh, why the Jews? Well, Moses answers that question in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Answers it pretty straightforwardly. Um, here's how he puts it. Deuteronomy 7, 6, and 7. You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possessions. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth... Egyptians, no. Babylonians, no. You just go right down through the... No, 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 no. Abraham, yes. Why? Why? It was not because you were more in number than any of the other people that the Lord set his love on you. And chose you, for you are the fewest of all the peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you. That's his answer. Why Abraham? Because God chose to set his love on Abraham. Yeah, but there had to be a reason. What? You just can't get behind God. And this text just says, no, I set my love upon Abraham. Now, just before we go on to the, the final point, uh, let me just go to a side text. And here's John 6, 65, the same sort of language, the same verb, giving, is the central, is the key verb um, in uh, John 6, 65. It's, it's actually the... Uh, uh, the, it's a secondary verb um, grammatically, but it is the, it's, the, it's the powerful one in, in the text. So here it is. Uh, and he said, this is why I told you, no one is able to come to me. This is Jesus talking. So here you are, you're, you're, you're a Christian, and you say, Jesus, how is it that I became a Christian? Well, let me tell you how you didn't. You didn't just make a nice free choice of coming to me. No one is able to do that. No one ever does that. I mean, you can't say that any more powerfully than Jesus says it. No one is able to come to me unless... It may be having been given to him by the Father. No one can come unless, except, 
if it may be, having been given by the Father. And so now, you see, you're, you're asked that question. How did, you, how did you come to faith? The Father gave me the ability to come to the Son. That's what happened. Thirdly, what should it mean to you, therefore, to have eternal life. What should it mean to you to have eternal life? That all that you have given to him, there's that giving again, he may give to them eternal life. Now see, this is the unbreakable link. If a person is given from the Father to the Son, without fail, the Son gives that person eternal life. Those given from the Father to the Son certainly end up with eternal life. Why? Because the Son sees to it. The Son sees to it. That to all you have given to him, he may give eternal life. Now here the link between verse 1 and verse 2 comes uh, shining through, and we're sort of going verses one, one verse at a time, but we're going to keep pulling in the stuff that was in front. Notice the parallel that takes place between verse 1 and verse 2 this way. Um, so in verse 1, Father, the hour has come, so here's the, big, here's the big ask. Glorify your Son. Glorify your Son. You see what matches up to that in the second verse? The Father gives all authority in heaven and on earth to the Son. Prayer answered. Glorify the Son. He did. All authority in heaven and on earth. Second parallel between verse 1 and verse 2. In order that the Son may glorify you. equals, in order that all that you have given to him, he may give to them eternal life. That is, the Son, among the ways, not the only way, among the ways that the Son glorifies the Father is that the Son produces a people who will praise the Father forever. That's you, if you're a believer. You will be glorifying God forever. Praising God forever. Eternal life. So what should it mean to you? Well, If the gospel is true, then this is true. The greatest thing that could possibly happen to a human being is that they come to own eternal life. You ever think about it that way? The greatest thing, the most valuable thing, the most wonderful thing that could possibly happen to a human being is that they come into the ownership of eternal life, which, as we'll see next week, is very knowledge of God related. But here we'll just say that they come into the possession of eternal life. And that happened to you if you're a believer. That happened to you. Do you walk around thinking that way? The greatest thing that could possibly happen to a human being in this hour has happened to me. The highest blessing that can land on anywhere, on anyone anywhere has landed on me. And, and again, we sang this last week. This is my story. 
This is my song. What a story. The greatest thing that could happen to any human being has happened to me. I was given from the, by the Father to the Son, and the Son has given me eternal life. That's what's happened. This is my story. What a story. What a story. True enough. Remember how Paul reflected on this, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. You think of our present circumstances. Anybody, anybody here tired of COVID-19? Anybody think, ah, oh, I'm sick of this. I'm done. I'm ready. Okay, let's cancel that. Let's go on and do something else. Uh, you know, send the order in. No more COVID-19. We're done with this. We're not, we're not doing this anymore. Listen to, the, listen to Paul's opening words in this little paragraph. Um, it's written precisely for people who are feeling just like we're feeling about such things. So we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart. Though our outer man is wasting away, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction that might last all your life does for some people. This light momentary affliction, Johnny Erickson dives into the Chesapeake Bay and is a quadriplegic for the next 60 years plus. This momentary light affliction, and you and I, everybody has in common, read all the setbacks and losses and inconveniences and trials of a worldwide pandemic, momentary and light, momentary and light, momentary and light, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So that we don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. You see the two unseen things that he's talking about from our text? Here's one unseen thing. You don't see the Father giving you to the Son. You know it happened after the fact, but it's an unseen thing. It's an eternal thing. You discover it. Wow, I'm a believer. The Father gave me to the Son. Now don't lose heart. The Father gave you to the Son. And the second unseen thing is, and the Son gave you eternal life. That's your story. That's your story. Um, you know, my, uh, my brother's son got cancer when his son was eight years old. He died when he was 13. And during those five years, he thought of little else. Cancer in hospitals and dying children. That was your life. That was your life for five years. That's all you could. But that's, I mean, he died 22 years ago. Next month, 22 years ago. I didn't think about that every day anymore. Still remembers it. Still painful. I didn't think about it every day. No, one time he's just immersed in that all that just he's just being crushed by that one thing. Day after day after day after day after day. And then it's just then it's then it's just gone. All of our trials, every one of your trials, that's gonna be its story. It's gonna be gone. You leave it behind. You won't think about it anymore be almost as if it never took place. In the new heaven and the new earth, it'll be like it really never took place. You remember it, probably. But, but this thing that is, this, this life that you've been given never goes away. 
we, we love that hymn, and it's just literally true. And it's, it's how this accomplishment of Jesus glorifies God so much. When we've been there 10,000 years, when we've been there 100,000 years, when we've been there and you plug in of time, when we've been there that long, here's what eternal life means. We've no less days to sing God's praise. We've no less days to express the glory of God than when we first begun. And you are able to say, if, you're, if you are a believer this morning, you are absolutely, actually able to say the simple words, again, that we sang last week. This is my story. If it's not your story, I, just, I invite you to Jesus. It could be your story. It could be your story. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek the forgiveness of sins there, the only place it can be found. And if you come, and if that desire, if you can find that desire within you, you will find that you've been given by the Father to the Son. And the Son will surely give you eternal life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I ask that you would enable us to see clearly the implications of such simple words that all authority is ultimately in you. May you be our authority. And that the wonder of our lives, the wonder of our story, is that we are among those who were given by you to your Son. And we are among those to whom the Son has given eternal life. Oh Lord, may we experience the wonder of that hope in Jesus' name. Amen.